I'm Jeanette Yoff. Good morning. I hope everyone's doing well today. Hope you and your family are well. So today's training is transracial adoption, race, identity, and integration. And I wanted to say a big thank you to Penny Lane for sponsoring this conference, this training today. Penny Lane has been around since 1969, and it was founded by Eve Markovitz. And it's amazing what Penny Lane has done. They have began as a group home for a handful of adolescent girls and has grown into a multi-service organization that serves 6,000 children, youth, and families and employs over 650 full-time social service providers and support staff. They have locations in North Hills. They also have a residential care, transitional permanent housing for foster youth, foster care and adoption services. So I'm very grateful that I was asked to be here today and present on transracial adoption, race, identity, and integration. So let's begin. Everyone should have the PDF of this slideshow. And I'm gonna start with something that I read about transracial adoption that I think is important for all of us. Visualize the task of transracially parenting adopted children as an onion. The heart of the onion is the job of parenting any child. Understanding normal child development and responding appropriately to all the needs of the child. The next layer of the onion represents the generic adoption issues involving separation from their birth family and the resulting grief, fear of abandonment, lack of trust and control, and so on. The final layer of the onion for the transracial adoptive parent is the layer of skill needed to parent a child of a different racial and or cultural background than one's own. Helping the child understand and feel good about who he is and helping the child cope with the baggage of living in a world that does not tolerate diversity well. I really like that opening because it really speaks to what transracial adoptive parenting is about. What is transracial adoption? It is an adoption in which a family of one race adopts a child of another race. In the United States, these terms usually refer to the placement of children of color or children from another country with Caucasian adoptive parents. Approximately 80 to 85% of international adoptions are transracial and approximately 40% of all adoptions in the United States are transracial. What we call transracial adoption may actually be a transcultural adoption. The joining of different ethnicities and cultures together. And I paused because I was a transcultural adoptee. I came from a Argentinian, Roman Catholic, Irish birth culture and was raised in a German, Jewish, Polish family. So transculturally, we came together and the joining of our different cultures and ethnicities made us into a family and that's how we were formed. So transracial adoptees, we're gonna refer them to TRAs and their families will face issues that relate to race and ethnicity that affect their lives, their whole lives. So we're gonna talk about that today. Research suggests that approximately two thirds of TRAs do not identify with their own racial status, which means that they're identifying with their parents' status. And this is really, really important for parents to understand adopting transracially, that they will want to mirror you. So we need to help mirror them. And I'm gonna talk about how we do that. So racial identity development is very important to understand so that we understand how race is cognitively understood 
and visually understood developmentally. So infants zero to six months demonstrate they notice skin color difference. They can look and see differences and point. Toddlers know, notice and then can comment on gender and racial difference. She's brown and he's black or she's white and he's brown. By age two, children notice and comment on gender, racial difference, learn color names, which they begin to apply to skin color. By age three, children will ask questions about their or others' racial identity, gender, and physical attributes. Why is his skin dark? Why is she pushed in a chair? My skin looks like yours, mommy. Why is my skin this color? And why is yours different? A book that I use with kids is Mommy and Me Don't Match. This is a wonderful book for children to talk about and ask questions about difference and showing that there are differences and we accept and reflect each other's differences together and honor and value our differences. Wonderful book. By age four, children are aware of family structure and economic class differences. Why does she have two mommies? I want Nike shoes like Chris has, or why can't I have the same sneakers as someone else? So they're beginning to truly understand racial difference and identity and development. Racial identity development for transracial adoptees. So racial identity is comprised of five dimensions. There's genetics, the genetic racial identity makeup for that person, whether they're African-American, Asian, Native Indian, or Caucasian, that genetic racial identity. This is who I am. Then there's the imposed racial identity, the racial identity that's reflected back at me and is presented to me. Then there's the cognitive racial identity. That is what I think about my identity, how I construct my thinking around my identity. And then there's the visual racial identity, how others see me. And then the feeling racial identity, how I feel about my racial identity. And so I'm going to show you a clip from the Harris Narratives, which is an introspective study of a transracial adoptee, the Harris Narratives, by Susan Harris O'Connor. And she wrote these narratives based on growing up transracially. She's African-American raised, actually she's biracial, raised in a Caucasian family. And she says, in the summer of 1999, I began a six month intimate and reflective exploration of my experiences. I confronted and considered potential bias by making myself as transparent as possible. She was guided by three questions. Do I belong? Where do I belong? How do I belong? The conclusion is that racial identity for her is dynamic, non-static, and non-hierarchical, and is defined by five constructs. These five constructs. So we're going to watch her reading from her narratives. And here we go. We're going to listen to her sharing her narratives with us today. I can truly understand why no one, including myself, would actually know or understand my complete racial, cultural, and religious identity. It was too much to swallow. It was too complex to understand. It was too difficult to follow. And for many, it was too non-traditional to respect. From kindergarten straight through college, I attended predominantly white schools. For example, out of my high school senior class of 500 students, there were approximately five kids of color. I also belonged to a country club for years and was the only non-white child to belong. I never saw another brown-skinned person on the premises and recall never seeing a brown-skinned person at any of the country clubs we competed against. So how did my social environment influence my racial and cultural identity? Between the first and fourth grades, my cognitive racial identity developed. I knew I was black and could make better sense of why my skin tanned the way it did and why it was light during the winter months. 
I was also very much aware that I was the only black female at school and that people didn't find my looks appealing. My failing racial identity, I believe, in some ways went numb. I felt connected to white people, but I also felt disconnected from them. It was as if there was this film of some transparent sort that covered all of me. In retrospect, I'm sure this transparent film speaks partly to the inner conflicts previously mentioned, coupled with how soulfully and psychologically taxing it is to be continuously surrounded by white mirrors that never mirror and periodically attempt to wipe out the part of you that isn't white. The area of me that I didn't see in the mirror. My religion, my birth parents, other transracial adoptive families, black adults, black girls, white teachers and little boys who thought brown skinned girls were smart and cute went numb. I'm fortunate that I mastered swimming, had good family and friends, and that I had a mother who knew about institutionalized racism and who at home insisted that I read and write. Between the fifth and eighth grades, my cognitive and feeling racial identity for the most part remained the same. My identity was very much caught up in socializing and swimming. I did my best not to feel the pain from being left out of the dating scene. And in high school, I was very popular, was quite content with, us, with myself as I've been in previous years. I was on a tennis team, co-captain of the swim team, and ended up vice president of my senior class. I also met up with the black kids I had met from church. A few kids actually apologized for the way they had treated me, and then did their best to teach me how to care for my hair and dance. <laughs> In college, my cognitive feeling and imposed racial identity seemed to be in sync. I had a diverse group of friends, dated black men, and learned how I experienced institutionalized racism over the years. My competitive energies were channeled into tennis and crew. And one of the most significant things that happened was that I met Sydney, my mentor, who was a spiritual, religious, and brilliant black man. A few years after entering the white workforce, I began to have racial identity problems. It was as if I had begun to unravel. I had no idea what was happening or why it was happening. I thought my parents and I had done so well dealing with various issues. My parents believed that one's backbone would get stronger, that one's character was actually built on how effectively one could deal with pain. So why was I having this difficulty being racially different and handling racist remarks? Shouldn't have been used to it by this point? Shouldn't it have gotten easy to deal with by now? Why was everything going to my core? Was it because I was a person of color? Was it because I was a woman of color? Was it because I was multiracial? Was it because I was a Jewish multiracial female? Did it have to do with being a doctor? Did it have to do with being a black female doctor? None of these questions were registering until I asked a lengthy question. Did it have to do with being a black transracial adult who had been raised in a white community who had been cut off from her birth history? I believe I was beginning to unravel because I was starting to feel and see that I'd been too socialized white to feel black and too dark skinned to ever be accepted as white. This realization was shattering to me. And as my identity continued to unravel, my adoptive parents became ill, and then my adoptive mother died. The ground dropped from beneath me, taking all that I was and smashing it into such unrecognizable pieces. The death of my mother in 1989 triggered the search for my birth mother. I had to find her because I wasn't feeling connected to the world, never mind to myself. Another part of the trauma of losing my adoptive mother and having an adoptive father who was suffering from Alzheimer's was that I was also grieving my racial identity as I then understood it. This insight hit me unexpectedly and like a brick. It was now so clear that my racial identity was very much connected to my white adoptive parents, that I had had access to things because I had white parents, not necessarily because of who I was. So what was going to happen to me now that I was parentless, now that I was a black person standing by myself? I had always spent white money, felt the unspoken privilege of white persons. Yes, 
I was grieving not only my adored adoptive mother, but my adoptive father as I had known him, my unknown birth mother, and my racial identity as I had known and lived it. This is really the first time anyone would have known that I was having problems. And what is surprising to me is that my visual racial identity had never become distorted, meaning I always saw the color of my skin accurately. Finding my birth mother in 1990 helped tremendously with the reformation of my identity, even though it didn't stop the tremendous pain I felt due to missing my adoptive mother and father. Post-reunion, I felt more connected to being white, human, and Jewish, and had a better understanding of my energy and physical being. My cognitive racial identity came to life in a way that it hadn't been before. In the past, I had known that I was multiracial, but now it was much more real because I now knew my birth mother and had pictures of my birth father to prove it. My feeling racial identity was unclear. I now had had two white Jewish parents, a white Jewish birth mother, and a birth father of color whom I hadn't met. This wasn't registering on a feeling racial identity level. Was I feeling white? Was I feeling black? Was I feeling multiracial? How does one feel black? How does one feel multiracial, particularly when white parents in a white environment have raised you? This has nothing to do with acting white or denying one's black roots. It's complex for the multiracial, transracial adoptee to formulate all these ideas they have about themselves and deciding and questioning who am I and where do I belong? And how do I want to identify? So the complexities of transracial families is the public will react. And I think for families, they get surprised because they don't realize how often the public will interact with them. They will question, they will wonder about their interracial nature of their family. People aren't instinctively curious. So parents need to prepare themselves and their children. They cannot live in an environment diverse enough or even friendly enough or good enough to protect their children from the pain of racism. And as we know in our country, it does exist. Discrimination hurts everyone, all races, all ages. And white parents are especially susceptible to being surprised or taken back by racist experiences because they don't anticipate them. So we need to educate them how to deal with public questioning and provide these boundaries and education for their kids. And I will be going through how to do that. Unfortunately, children will experience racism at their schools and their community without their knowing, without their parents knowing. And children may feel uncomfortable talking about these issues and things that come up with their white parents because they're white and they don't know if they understand. And I listen to a lot of transracial adoptees and they say, we need to learn from people like us. We need to be with people like us. Only people like us can teach us what it means to be us. So white parents need to understand if you're adopting transracially, please Accept that there are many areas where you can provide education, support, love, and guidance, but in the area of race, children need to learn from their counterparts, from those who are like them. And mentors, um, I'm going to be talking about different organizations to be involved with for families of transracial adoption. Now, parents may not be aware that they are even colorblind or what's called race mute. That means we don't see color. Unfortunately, there are there is a celebrity who has adopted two black children who has verbally stated, I do not see color. And this is going to be very unfortunate for her children. And I think you know who I'm talking about. Uh, and if you don't, just look that up. Um, she's a singer and celebrity, and it's, it was very disheartening to hear that because she's not seeing her children. 
and she wants to see what she wants to see. And that's what happens. And this can be a direct result of the strong desire that their children fit into their mold. And then what we get caught in is not recognizing and understanding white privilege. And, you know, this is a diversity training as much as it is a training in transracial adoption. It's about understanding diversity and honoring diversity. And there's not one way of being in the world and one race. And when I learned about white privilege, it was only within the last 10 years that I understood, wow, what white privilege is. So parents do need to be educated. So I'm going to show a short two minute film on what is white privilege. This was made by an adoptive parent and it's easy to take in. It's an easy to understand. Parents need education. So let's watch this video on what is white privilege. White privilege is something we use to describe unearned benefits that people who are white get simply because they're white. For many of us that are white, we don't notice white privilege. What does white privilege look like? It looks like when I walk into a store or a restaurant, I expect to be treated with respect, and generally I am. I expect to be given the best available table, and generally I am. I expect to go to the mall and not be harassed or followed in a store if I'm just browsing and not buying, as if I might be stealing something. That's not always true for people of color, therefore white privilege. It's important to think about white privilege as a white parent parenting a child of color because fundamentally my experience of life is different than my children's. And that has everything to do with how I'm going to be a good parent to them. If I don't get that first important piece, I'm going to have trouble understanding what's happening to them, what they're feeling, what they're experiencing, and how they might respond to it. It allows me to become their ally if I understand what it is and name it. Just like we do with kids, we have to name things for ourselves too. Okay, so as you can see, white privilege is something that parents do need to be aware of. Very, very important because parents who go into transracial adoption and don't have even friends of color in their community, in their friend circle, is your child going to be the first non-white person you've loved and served? And this is a meme that was made by a transracial adoptee. And so we need to understand and take these factors into great consideration before and while we're thinking about if a parent is thinking about transracial adoption, they definitely need this type of training and understanding. So what is that lifelong developmental quest for TRAs? The who am I question, where do I come from? Who do I identify with? How do I integrate both of my cultures? How do I integrate and have love for both of my families, which I do feel connected to? Children have love for their adoptive parents and their birth families. And for those of you who know me, I do a lot of open adoption. And open adoption is healing for children because they get to see where they come from. They know their birth culture. They can have love for both of their families. It's doable, it's possible, and it's also good for the birth mother and birth father and the siblings to know where everyone is and know that they can still come back together and be a full, bigger, more diverse family together. So it's very powerful and validating. That's a big piece for adoption. Adoptees need a lot of validation that mirroring, reflecting of who I am and where do I come from. And that's why open adoption is so powerful for an adoptee and validating and mirroring. And kids, 
I explain to parents are not confused. They don't get confused as to who is my mother. They understand there's my birth family and they may call her by her name. What, however they want to identify their family is how we identify them. And I'm going to go into that a little bit later. So the internal fears of TRAs, uh, even, in, if an, even if an adoptee is raised in their great adoptive family, that doesn't mean adoptees feel comfortable speaking about their feelings about adoption with their parents. It's very hard for them to be fully honest with their parents. And like I said before, I listen to a lot of transracial adoptees. I've always been working with transracial adoptees ever since I started doing clinical work with adoptive families. And it's very hard for them to be transparent and honest because the fear of abandonment is so intrinsic that if I tell you that I'm even thinking and missing my birth family, even for non-transracial adoptees, the fear of abandonment is, is, is incubates. So the internal world is I miss my birth mother. I need to be around people like me. I need to know people like me. I wonder what it would have been like to be raised by her. These are all valid. And I wonder what it would be like to go into my racial country, to go visit my birth country, to go what's called reculturate into my birth country, experience my culture and, and live there. And it can feel for the parent that they're feeling, well, am I not doing enough? Am I not giving enough? Am I not providing enough? And parents need to understand it's not a rejection of you. It's a reflection of your child's internal world and internal fears. So the gratitude that a TRA is expected to feel towards their adoptive parents is so strong. When the narrative begins with, we saved you from, or you almost died, or you're better off here than being there with they and them. And this is the device and, the div and what we don't want, because then it's they and them, and it's not them and us and we, and we're in this together. It's about staying in the diversity and understanding as a parent, your child will want this and will need this, and it's their birthright. And we want to provide this, and it actually will make your relationship stronger and their your connection with them stronger. Because we don't want, and TRAs talk about this, that rescue narrative of you rescued me the rescue, you are my white savior. And these are difficult topics for parents to talk about. When parents think they have solved all of the child's problems by, by adopting them. And these are sticky things that we need to talk about and make people very uncomfortable when we're talking about diversity trainings. Because some parents don't recognize until they're in a training like this, wow, I've said that to my child. Well, you can go back and repair and go, wow, I've learned something today. And I understand that it's not okay to be phrasing things in that way. And I want to have love and have you have love and value for all your families, for your birth family and for us as well. So we want to be careful in how we're phrasing things. And unfortunately, the Supreme Court Justice did phrase how she adopted her children from Haiti as she almost died. Well, I can tell you that on social media, transracial adoptees were extremely angry that she phrased it this way and that she even shared their story without their permission. That's their story to tell, not hers. So it's really important there's a lot of sensitivities in transracial adoption. So we just you want to be aware, breathe, know that it will feel uncomfortable and that's okay. These are growing pains. This is how we learn. So this is a photo during the Black Lives Matter, one of the protests. 
My family is white, but that won't save me. So here we have a clear indication that we have a transracial family, and this was posted by a transracial adoptee, where she doesn't feel supported by her Caucasian parents. So really, really important for parents to be curious with themselves. Do I have some implicit bias? Do I have white privilege? Am I not honoring and valuing my child's culture, their racial heritage? I need to look inside myself more and question, am I doing enough in that area? So the internal dissonance, the disharmony for TRAs, they may seek to be viewed as credible, authentic, real members of their ethnic community. And on the other side of this paradox, in which TRAs are treated as though they are white because of their adoption by white parents, rather than as authentic members of their ethnic group. We pose it that TRAs are often also treated as real members of their ethnic group, but they often feel unable to respond as expected and find that their adoption status must be revealed and thereby, no, and thereby negate their identity as authentic members of their ethnic group. Therefore, adoptees are in a double bind. And I'm going to share a little story. I know people came in late, but I was transculturally adopted. I was born into a Roman Catholic, Argentinian, Irish birth culture. Then I was raised in a Jewish, Polish, German adoptive family. When I went back to Argentina, I, of course, blended in with my ethnic culture. And people came to me as I was Argentinian, because I was with my Argentinian, I was having a reunion. And they would speak to me in the native tongue. And I couldn't speak back. And it was very conflicting. It's very difficult. It brought up all that loss again of what I didn't have. I needed this earlier. I needed this as a child. I need to learn how to acculturate, reculturate into my community and understand who my tribe, my people are. And it would only bring me closer with my adoptive family. And if I cannot say that enough, it will bring the adoptive family closer when they truly allow their child to be enriched by their racial, cultural history. So microaggressions is a term, and I did provide stud research studies as handouts, part of this training, and there's a whole study on microaggressions and how this impacts a transracial adoptee. Microaggressions are those little attitudes, those little judgments, prejudices, and racism that are communicated in these subtle, overt ways that are can be aggressive. In contrast to the tra traditional form of racism that references systems of advantage based on race, microaggressions are forms of racism that are acted upon in small interactions, micro level. That's why they're called microaggressions between individuals or groups in subtle and often dismissive ways. So is that your real son? And this came, this was a meme from an adoptive parent. Is that your real hair? So finding ways to mitigate the microaggression and hold people accountable for what they're questioning and how they're questioning. So I looked online and these are transracial adoptees, and these are the microaggressions that they encounter in their daily lives. Why do you sound white? You're not like the other black people I know. You speak so well. Courtney, I never see you as a black woman. So it's almost, it's dismissive. It's not seeing who they are, but acting on what they're appearing to be. And it's questioning in a way that is aggressive. 
that is questioning their identity. And it's hurtful. It's extremely hurtful because it keeps them in this place of how do I then share who I am when I'm still figuring out who I am? So it can not only be hurtful, but it can be triggering and create this identity confusion for adoptees. So we need to be aware of our microaggressions and they need to be educated in how to respond when they receive these microaggressions. So we're going to watch a video about four minutes of transracial adoptees talking about integrating their culture within their, their racial culture with their families and the community being without their families and how they're treated differently. Really important to listen to the voices of transracial adoptees so we understand on a deep level what they feel and, and what they need. So this video actually came from PACT Camp uh, it was filmed, and Packed Camp is a camp every summer for trans transracial adoptive families, and families come together, and they are educated on race, on white privilege, on talking with your child, how to do their hair properly, how to help them be part of their community, how to understand what their needs are. Within the field of adoption, the voice of the adoptive parents often takes precedent to adoptees' first-hand experiences. PACT believes that adoptees are the truest experts of their own experience. They welcome adoptee voices and support them as a part of their mission. I was invited to PACT Camp in 2015 to have conversations with teens and tweens about their experience and correlating feelings about being adoptees of color. What do you wish that your classmates knew about how it feels to be adopted? I wish they'd have a little more sympathy. Um, I wish it wouldn't be so hard to be around people that aren't adopted. They used to ask, oh, your mom used to be Chinese, right? Or like, they used to ask the race of my parents and like, oh, like, why'd they give you up? And yeah. Used to be hard. Yeah. I was put in foster care and then I was an adopt and then I was adopted and my life is not tragic, I guess. I think that it's kind of something you're never going to completely like be like this is what it means to be adopted. But I guess you just kind of figure it out like a little bit and you're like, yeah. That's, that's cool. Still confused, but that's cool. I haven't had really any ne negative things. It's just more people are surprised yeah. to find out I'm adopted. So. And when you tell them, no, I'm just adopted, like, does that feel like a empowering statement or like a put down or just neutral? Uh, it feels like a good statement. Um, I tell my mom sometimes that I feel like I have a second chance because of all the opportunities her and my dad give me in my very fortunate life. And so I'm able to try new things and go new places that I feel like I wouldn't be able to go without them. For me, it was never a big deal. I was like, yeah, okay, I'm adopted. And everyone was like, what, really? And I was like, yeah. Why do you think they're surprised and excited at first? Because it's like a exciting experience. I don't really know. I wouldn't know because I'm just like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, but I guess they think it's like exciting and new and like interesting. How about teachers? Are there um, any assignments that are ever given that make you talk about your family history? Um, yeah, like we have to do baby pictures and stuff like that. And usually I, they're like, do you have a baby picture? Why didn't you bring one in? And I have to describe why I don't have one and the reason why I don't have one. And then when I do that, they all start acting really sad toward me and weird. Do they assign an alternate? They tell me to draw a picture draw a picture of yourself as a baby instead of bringing one in? Yeah. How does it feel when your classmates all bring in pictures of themselves as, as a baby and you have a picture that you drew of yourself? It feels kind of like different to like know that, oh, everyone else can have these pictures and I'm just stuck with this drawing. 
because like you want to fit in, you want to be like everyone else, but you just can't. When people tell you that you're lucky to be adopted, it's kind of true because people, if the situation was bad at home or something happened with your birth mom or birth dad, it's nice to have a good loving family, not that they're are not loving, but to wait until that situation passes. Are there any ways you'd feel unlucky being adopted? I don't know. Yeah, but I can't describe it. Hmm. Can you I'm try? bad at describing it, I don't know. Hmm. I just know there's something. There's something in there that doesn't feel so great. Yes. Do people say that you should be lucky that you're adopted? Have you ever heard of that before? I haven't heard lucky, but I've say it's great to be adopted. That's what I've heard. Do you feel that way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I wasn't only adopted, I was also foster cared for two years, so. And you felt glad about that? That was good. Do you feel grateful to have been adopted, or is there a different word you'd use about having to be adopted? I feel upset that my birth mother gave me up just a little bit, but I'm mainly happy because I probably would not have had a good childhood being raised in a divorce. You think so? Yeah. So you're, you feel like the, the life that you have? I feel so-so. We're low key on Mother's Day. Yeah, and same with like my adoption day. I was like, hey, mom, I was adopted day. She's like, I know. I thought we weren't gonna mm. celebrate that because it's also a sad day because you gained this amazingness, but someone else lost it, so. I'm with my mother, Jana. She's a single mother to me, um, and um, we're a interracial um, family. Is she Caucasian? Um, yes, um, foster to adopt. Um, I've been with her about three years now. When you see an African American that's like big with this middle aged 54 year old, like five foot four lady, yeah. Caucasian, and if you don't know who we really are, then you're just going to think that I'm trying to take something from her. What would Marvel. you like to say to the people who are, who well, see you, well, a I, six foot buff black guy and a mm -hmm. petite Caucasian, yeah. your mom, what, was, what would be something you'd like to share as you get these stares and people wondering? Well, when they stare at me, I, I kind of stare at them back, just showing them that, yes, this is what's happening. Get, um, deal with it. It's 2015. Things are changing. Um, the, the look of a modern family. Yeah, like uh -huh. it's it, we're not different than who you are, and you're not different than who we are. People have challenged, you know, my blackness based on the fact that both of my parents are white. You feel so, like you're kind of in the middle, that you're playing kind of on right, both sides. Right, right. You're protecting your parents. Mm -hmm and their identity right. and who they are, but right. then you're also protecting your own race or identity. Right. Yeah. That's and a that's, unique space to be. Yeah. When people ask me about, like, why I don't look like my parents at school, I tell them I'm adopted and they ask more questions and it just feels really awkward. Does it feel awkward to answer all their questions or what about it feels awkward? Um, trying to, like, explain, like, when they ask, like, oh, do you know your birth mother, or have you ever met any of your siblings or anything? It's like, it's just, like, uncomfortable, I guess. Does it feel like it's really private information? Yeah. I'm black, I'm African American, that's how I identify. Um, and until about a half a year ago, that's what I thought I was. I thought that I was fully African American. Um, but after speaking with my sibling, who still, I mean, she's, you know, she has her own child now and everything, but, she, you know, she grew up with my birth mother, um, and she was saying that we might not be fully black, um, and we don't know. And this is, of course, both for me, um, the struggles that many African Americans face not knowing your entire history, um, intertwined with uh, being adopted and not knowing, you know, my own immediate family's history, but... Um, I'm taking genetics tests and I, um, I haven't gotten results yet because I sort of wanted to wait for school to be over. Does it feel threatening to not be fully black? If I don't know if that's what's threatening, it's just, I guess, 
I've never felt really uncertain about any aspect of my identity. Um, like I've always been confident in uh, my sexual orientation, my gender identity, my racial identity, um, you know, all that. Like I knew I was a straight, cisgender, black male. Um, so this is sort of the first time I've ever been challenged in an identity that's not strictly adoption, that's not questions that tend to, you know, uh, perplex a lot of adopted youth and adults. What do you wonder about your birth mom? I wonder what they look like um, and how they feel. And they um, took me when somebody else took me away. And how they felt when someone else took you away? Yeah. The, my parents keep saying that they felt really sad. I don't really know them. I just know their names. And I don't get to see them because I don't know where they are or where they live. I want to talk about or hear about your birth parents and what you think of them, if you see them or if you don't see them very much, if you miss them. Um, sometimes I wake up in the night like just sort of upset and I think about them sometimes and I don't usually have too much feelings about them but when I do have some it usually lasts a long time so it, it takes a little while to get over it sometimes my parents help me sometimes they don't sometimes I get angry and sometimes I don't but all in all it, it doesn't happen that much when every time I see them I feel really happy and then when they when I have to go, I I don't feel happy anymore. But I'm still glad that I I get to see them. I sometimes call him my half brother, or my brother, because I have two, and I sometimes joke around with them and say I have one whole brother because <laughs> I have two halves. Two halves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanted to be to know who my birth family were because I had a lot of questions. The first question I had was, why was I put up for adoption? I've never met my birth father. He left, which is, to my, the best of my understanding, part of the reason that my mother, who kept, I'm the youngest of five, and she kept all my older siblings who are significantly older than me. And so to my understanding, like part of the reason that she could not keep me is um, one of my siblings has some um, disabilities, and then also my birth father left um, and so to my understanding, that's why I was placed for adoption, um, so that I could have better resources. And, sure. Um, How does that make you feel, knowing that your siblings were kept and you weren't? Um, I mean, that's always something I've grappled with. I met my birth parents just a few years ago, mm -hmm. and I was like, I always felt like standing closer to my mom yeah. than my birth mom. Because mm -hmm. that's a person they've grown up with, and you've like actually, like, you kind of know them a little bit better than you do your birth mom, which is kind of like, for people who aren't adopted, that's kind of a weird thing to say. Yeah. That you know a different mother more than you know the person that gave birth to you. Sometimes I feel kind of guilty yeah. describing my birth mom as kind of a stranger because mm. she kind of felt like a stranger for a while. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way. Not really as in guilty. I... I find it like a new experience just to, and it feels really good to get to meet the person that um, gave birth to me and it was just a really good feeling and really nice to meet her for the first time. It's kind of hard to lose contact with them. Yeah. Are there things you wish you could say to them right now? Well, I keep a journal with notes and stuff just in case I find them or if they find me, I'll just give them the journal and then they'll read what I have to say. Do you have a relationship with your birth parents? Uh, not at the moment. I, I haven't really shown any interest in pursuing a uh, connection with them. I don't have any hard feelings toward them. I am, however, interested just to see about their whereabouts and how they're doing. Um, so so you're interested the... in like where they are, how they're doing, but not really interested in pursuing a search? Not yet, but I think I will want to sometime in the future. And what do you foresee, like, your family, your parents' involvement in your search? 
My mom has definitely talked to me about starting a search or showing some interest and in where I'm coming from and my background because every Mother's Day and every, I guess, my adoption day when my adoption was finalized, it's always, uh, she says, like, oh, I thank Claire for you every day and stuff. So I think she'd love to meet her and my father as well. I only have one half brother, but I don't know where the other four brothers that I have are. Yeah, I have four others, but I don't know where they are. My birth dad never told me. Did you have any questions for her when you met her or the last two times that you've seen her? Well, um, because when she gave birth to me, or sometime before that, my birth dad left. So I, that's basically what I was trying to ask about, like, those times that I met her. I'd rather get caught up with my birth mom then dwell on the fact that I didn't really like get to experience living with her at all. You want to kind of fast forward to present day? Yeah. I mean I know why she mm, put me up for adoption. I don't know if that's the right use of words. What do you like to say? Some people say um, gave me away, gave me up, placed me, relinquished. There's all these different <laughs> words that feel different to people, but what, what does it feel like your birth mother did? She put me up for adoption or like, yeah. I feel privileged, I feel lucky to have parents that I consider to be allies, not just to me, but to black communities in my city, in my area. And how do they show that? Um, and they, you know, like, even when I was um, kind of too stressed, too overwhelmed to go to rallies in San Francisco and Oakland, uh, my mom would always go. Um, and she, she would never, you know, she, even, even when she was overwhelmed, she would never uh, not take the time to have a conversation with me about race. Are you adopted or were you in foster care? Yes, I'm actually former foster youth. I feel like I don't really fit in a, in a lot of places because the white friends that I had or whatnot, they would, you know, make a bunch of racist black jokes and then other black friends that I had, they thought I was too whitewashed and would call me other names and make fun of me for caring about school and whatnot. So it was like, I didn't know how they were going to be and if they were going to be accepting of me or just think, you know, I was trying to be something I was not or something. One time we were at the basketball game with my one of my half brothers. I was walking with him and I was walking back to it with his to my mom's and his mom and um they and these basketball players said, Who's this? And he's like, My brother and I'm just like, Oh, okay. It, it, I was just surprised that he was gonna say that. It was nice of him to do that because they were because they were being really mean to me when the basketball players and he said, and they were just like making fun of me and stuff of walking with him and he just stood up to them and said, Oh, that's so great. So he was an ally, basically? Yeah, that's what. What did you say? I said he was an ally, basically. An ally. When you grow up, it still might be hard, but you know that there are other people in the world that share your same experience. Exactly. Do you believe that? Like when you are talking to me yeah. as an adult, do you think it's possible that I still think of some of these same things that you... Yeah. And what do you think about that? Like, is that a good thing? Is it bad? Is it neither? Is it... Um, it's good and bad, you know. You have bad thoughts sometimes, you get mad sometimes, but then there are good thoughts like, you know, I could... I could not be very, I couldn't be in this situation right now. And I could be, I could have a life that isn't as good as this one. I want to flip the script because I want to prove that I'm just not another product of the system. I'm capable of so much more than what people expect of me and I have big goals and big dreams and you know being foster youth or whatnot that doesn't mean that you're less than anyone else. I want to flip the script because I think adoptive parents think they understand but they really don't. Like my mom tries to tell my story to people 
And she does a pretty good job, but it's not quite right. And I'm like, wait, hold on. So I think that I'd like to flip the script because people don't quite understand. They think they do, but they don't. Well, to flip the script, I guess, I, I wish people could know specifically for transracial adoptees um, that your culture is not just learned from your parents, it's learned from all around you. And so, like I was saying, like being black, I was, you know, I was not just raised by my parents, but I was raised by the black men and women that I saw on TV and in my com communities. And, and those people helped me. And so, and often when parents, when my parents or when I hear other adoptive parents speak, they make it seem like they had tried uh, consciously to push their child's at the culture that they had been born into onto them. And I don't really agree with that. I think that it's just sort of all learned um, unconsciously. I want to flip the script because I want people to understand that being adopted isn't that different from you guys and that even though like you might say, are you with your real family? Technically they are a real family. It's not like they're different or anything like that. It's just people that are taking care of you, that love you and that you love back. I would like to flip the script because um, of the stereotypes and like that adopted people can only be black or that when you're adopted you can't, you're never going to see the people you actually love or your real family even though your family right now couldn't be considered the family um, you were from originally, but they're still your family. You know, I love my parents, so I need to keep the balance between taking care of them and taking care of myself or the black communities that I have become a part of. I am adopted, but I have a very different story, and like I said, like I feel alone sometimes, even in a group full of adopted, transracially adopted African-American teens. You, know, you can't get more, much more specific than that, but each story is still different. Race matters. So here are five tasks for adoptive parents that we need to educate them. There may be parents here today. There may be social workers, therapists. We need to provide them with these tasks of understanding. So they need to acknowledge the existence of prejudice, racism, and discrimination. They must recognize that race is not a taboo subject. And that's why I'm doing this today. I had an adoptee say, oh, you're going to do a transracial adoptive training. And I said, yes, I am, because I'm going to show we need to talk about diversity in our country. This is so prevalent right now. We need to be able to be comfortable being uncomfortable talking about racism, prejudice, discrimination, and stereotypes do exist. So parents need to recognize this because we want to avoid things that are uncomfortable. That's our natural way of being. And we also need to confirm and affirm that slavery existed. And it's really hard for parents to talk about this. And 619 years ago, yes, slavery existed. And we need to understand it, why this happened, how this happened, how it ended. And by admitting the existence of these inequities, parents can avoid denying and minimizing the child's experience. They will feel heard. This will be really hard for some parents and adoptees respect their parents who get comfortable with this discomfort. So parents will need to go into environments where everybody looks like their child and they are the minority and face their own prejudices. That's one of the most important things to do, I believe, for an adoptive parent. Before you even adopt a child of another race, go into their birth culture. Go in their neighborhoods. Go where there's a lot of Black people and see what that feels like. Because if you're going to bring your Black child into your white neighborhood, this is what it's going to feel like for your child going into your neighborhood. 
when you go in their neighborhood and understand and feel what that feels like and how there is no diversity there. So I'm going to read an excerpt from a book called Something Happened in Our Town. I just read this to a child yesterday and he was so moved, transracial adoptive family, he was so moved and he felt so heard and acknowledged. And this is for kids ages, I would say five to 10. Uh, something happened in our town. I'm only gonna read a few pages, okay? Something bad happened in our town. The news was on the TV, the radio and the internet. The grown-ups didn't think the kids knew about it. But the kids in Miss Garcia's class heard some older kids talking about it and they had questions. After school, Emma asked her mother, why did the police shoot that man? It was a mistake, said her mother. I feel sad for the man and his family. Yes, the police thought he had a gun, said her father. It wasn't a mistake, said her sister, Liz. The cop shot him because he was black. Emma was confused. He is brown, not black, she said. Some black people have dark brown skin and some have light brown skin, Emma's father explained. Black usually means African-American. Most of their ancestors were brought here from Africa as slaves. I know what a slave is, said Emma. That's when you have to have to do whatever the other person says. Yes, slaves had to do whatever white people told them to do. Even after slavery ended, white people didn't let black people live there where they wanted to, go to school with white people, or even vote. Who are white people? White people came here from places in Europe or Russia or other countries. We are white, even though our skin may be light tan. Did our family do those bad things a long time ago? This is a white family. She's prefacing, asked Emma. Yes, answered her mother. Back then, many white people thought that they were better than black people, even though it wasn't true. Liz added, some white people still think most black men and boys are dangerous, even though they're not. Was the man that got shot dangerous? No, said her mother. Shooting him was a mistake. It was a mistake that is part of a pattern. Like the pattern on my blanket? Yes, but this pattern is being nice to white people and mean to black people. It's an unfair pattern. So they go on to the next family, <clears throat> excuse me, of an African-American family talking about the same shooting in their town and understanding and making sense of why this happened and why there's confusion for kids and what can we do to make things right. And so it's a wonderful book that values diversity. And these two kids go to their school and they meet a new child who's a child of color and he doesn't get picked for playing soccer. And they remember what their parents said, that we include everybody, that we have respect for all races, all ethnicities. And they ask him to be on his team and they all play together in soccer at the end of the book. So it's a powerful book uh, for kids. You can stop and let them ask questions. Uh, there are some other books that I use with kids, all the colors we are, the colors of us, and let's talk about race. We need to feel, we need to build this grit of talking about this. If you are working with transracial families, you need to explore. You need to go into your own self and go, okay, do I have any implicit bias? Is there anything that feels uncomfortable to me? What do I need to be aware of? And how do I connect and read more and understand more. And just like you're here today at this training, um, be informed and educated about. So that's task number one. So talking about race, racism, discrimination. Task number two, explain why the child's minority group is mistreated. 
parents must explain and define racism, prejudice, discrimination, and bigotry, and why such behaviors exist, like in that book. Understanding the behavior exists. Educate about the historic roots of ideological institutional, institutionalized and systemic racism. Talk about racial issues, even if they do not bring up the subject. Like I even read that yesterday. And I said, hey, can I read you a book? And I showed him three books. And he chose this one. And we talked about it. We talked about how racism started and why are black people judged and how they were brought to this country and what happened and how that was wrong. And so we need to talk about it. And if you need books, use books because that helps kids feel heard, seen, and received and begin the dialogue. So also use opportunities such as television programs, articles, school assignments that talk about race to open the communication. Um, for teen adoptees, I use Beneath the Mask. There's a lot of interracial stories in here. Asian, um, Asian adoptees, African-American adoptees, Native American adoptees share their stories in the book. And then there are activities for the adoptee to do to explore their own identity. Wonderful book, Beneath the Mask. It's a workbook for teens. And I know some organizations have done um, six-week workshops just based on that book for transracial adoptees. So highly recommend um, that book as well. So the third task, provide the child with a repertoire of responses to racial discrimination to empower them. So here's where they need education. And so there's an acronym called WISE UP. It's actually used for when your assets was developed by the Center for Adoption Support and Education in Washington. And they created this acronym for any adoptee who's asked, are you adopted? And the child gets to decide which acronym to use. W, do I walk away? So I've adapted this a little bit and it's, it works for transracial adoptees in helping them decide how they want to respond because what these acronyms really signify are boundaries. So I put wonder and walk away. Wonder, should I engage with this person? Is this a microaggression? Could my engagement foster more aggressiveness? Could this create more conflict? Do I feel comfortable? Allowing them to assess, do I engage or not? Because I'm reading your nonverbal cues and you're not appearing safe to me to engage. So I think I'm going to walk away. Or I, do I want to use an I statement? Why do you ask? Why are you wondering? I, why are you curious? Or I don't want to answer. Or I don't feel comfortable with your question. Forming and deciding what is your go-to answer? How do you want to respond? And this is an activity that parents can do with their kids and you can do in a session if you're a therapist, helping kids figure out how they want to manage and handle these encounters because they will have them. Share something. You can share something about your story. Yes, we are a multicultural family. We are are made of many cultures and ethnicities. We're a family, thanks for asking. E, educate them. There are ways to respond so they can regain composure and make a choice that feels good to them when faced with this discrimination. A parent, for example, I find your remark offensive. You can't talk to me that way. Please don't say that type of thing again. It's being very clear, firm and confident and for transracial adoptees, they are watching their parents. They are watching. So be firm and confident in how you're talking and showing up for your child. Because that in and of itself, your child will feel so respected, so heard, so acknowledged. And sometimes kids don't have the capacity 
developmental capacity because they feel so vulnerable in these situations to voice, to say these, one of these things. So as parents, you ask your child, which I, I've always told parents, when something happens, go, excuse me, go to your child and go, which one would you like to do? W, I, S, or E. Empower them in these moments to create the boundary that they want to create. And if a child feels overwhelmed in that moment, the parent can make a decision, usually walking away, because we don't want to share a narrative of the story for the child that the child does not feel comfortable with. We need to respect that the child's not speaking about it. The, the parent is not allowed and given permission yet to speak about it with anyone other than themselves. So here's another clip from a video and these videos are important. And I hope this presentation is providing you with, um, many videos that you can show to families so that they also can understand. So these are family stories dealing with racism and discrimination. I'm Kelly Bethay. I have two mixed race children, half Irish and half black. My name is Kathy Weiss and I have a 34 year old daughter and a 27 year old son, Jeremy, who is adopted. My name is Shelley Patrick and I'm the mother of two sons. They're my biological children. My name is Frank Cayetti and I have two children, a six and a half year old daughter named Lucy and a three and a half year old adopted son named Joseph. My husband and I started dating when we were in our 30s. And we never really thought about the fact that we were a mixed race couple until we decided to have children. My kids were gonna face situations that I just didn't know how to navigate because I had never faced them myself. I remember just sobbing and my husband taking me in his arms and telling me that it's not my job to teach my son to be a black man, that it's his job, that it's my job to teach my kids respect and kindness, just like every other mother in the world, regardless of what color my skin is. We tried to have another child. There were issues with me that was not gonna enable us to have another biological child. Social workers actually came out with a policy against transracial adoptions. There was a strong belief that white families couldn't provide what black children needed for their own identity. We did not live the black experience in America and how do we provide him some connection to what the world sees him as even if his personal experience is slightly different than that. We wanted to adopt for many reasons. My wife was very much compelled. She has an adopted brother and she worked at a nonprofit uh, that worked with a lot of former foster youth. Talked about trying to have a biological child first, and then the next thing we were interested in doing is adopting. I was talking to a woman I met at a theater opening. She's African American. The subject of my kids came up because I love talking about them. She asked point blank, which is a really good question, are you going to allow some influence in his life from other African American people? I was kind of stumped for a second and then realized I absolutely have to. I was only about 20 when I had Jason. I don't know if it was my immaturity, but I didn't really look at my kids as black or white or half. I just looked at them as my children. When I was going through my divorce, I was seeing a therapist at the time. She pointed out how important it was for the children to have regular time with their father and his side of the family so that they could learn the nonverbal communication skills of the black culture. So that was something I was always mindful of and made sure that that happened. Consultation is just an admission that you don't know everything. I, it doesn't make me feel weird at all. It makes me a little sad to think that he's going to have some experiences that I can't entirely relate to. My daughter's hair was definitely a learning experience. I have a niece who also has a mixed race daughter. She actually has given me so much information, YouTube tutorials, Pinterest, learning what co-washing is, just making her realize how precious and amazing her hair is. I don't think we would have thought about moving out of Philadelphia for a minute. Jeremy wouldn't feel out of place growing up. He would see other people that looked like him, family friends and personal friends and teachers. You know, we were always aware of that strong presence in his life. He would have the resources. He would go somewhere if he needed to figure things out. My husband has had to teach me. I have taken on his thoughts on this 
that you would rather know who's a racist because now you know who to stay away from. It's the ones who aren't saying it, but are thinking it are the ones that are the real issues. When Jeremy was a very young child, strangers would come up to us and say, oh, he's going to be a great ball player, isn't he? At some point, I would say, why? Because he's black. At other points, I just got fed up with it and said, no, he's actually going to be a brain surgeon. It is stunning to me what comes out of people's mouths, and I am still not quiet about it. I recall this one time I went to look at a townhouse. When I went in to view it with the realtor, a person who lived there came in and he was like saying, oh, this is a great complex and you'll, you'll like living here and we don't have any, and he used the N-word, that live here. I'm gonna get choked up. And um, I said, well, I will not be running here because I have two half black children and it would make me nervous to have them here with somebody that thinks that way. Some white people just let it roll off. When you have children, you don't just let it slide. You teach your kids tact and you teach your kids that ignorance is everywhere. But unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to save them from everything. It has been very important for me to talk to Jeremy. He had one incident where somebody said something to him, I think when he was around 11 or 12, and he never told us and dealt with it probably by talking to his friends. I felt like I had failed him. His friends maybe were a better resource. I felt like, why can't he talk to me about this? You have to teach and you have to talk to your kids about police brutality. You have to talk to your kids about racist undertones. I would rather have the conversation before anybody else has it with her so that she understands where we stand. The interesting thing that I think I've observed about race, I have a privilege to not be cognizant of it and others do not. I have to be empathetic to my son in that regard. The issues that Joseph may face terrifies me. Someday, I'm gonna have to have a real tough conversation. Now, I just want him to be like the happiest three and a half year old kid out there. My husband being a black parent, he had talks with them. But a few times when they came home and told me they had been called a racial name, it really upset me. But then when they told me how they handled it, I was so proud of them. I knew that they were equipped and strong to handle it. Jeremy definitely had identity issues. I don't think it was all smooth sailing and everything's been, you know, leave it to beaver nice for him. He had to figure out what it meant to be a black man in America with a white family and a Jewish background because he walks into a room and the narrative is written. He's always struggling with his own definition against a public definition is of him. So my hope for the future is that, you know, we start to evolve as a nation. When you see children playing together, they may be cognizant of the difference in the way that they look, but there is no, I don't think there is any preconceived notion. I think that racism is a learned behavior. My hope for my children is that they grow up and they learn to be kind and they learn to be respectful. Jeremy is trying to make it in the world of music right now. I think he has great talent, but I am a party of one with a little bit of bias. I just want them to feel safe and feel loved and secure in who they are. I hope that my children are successful and enjoy their lives and have fun. That's a great video for parents um, to hear from other parents who have been there, done this, know the experience. Um, it would be wise for anyone thinking about transracially adopting a child to um, hear from other parents, be on a, listen to a panel of adoptive parents. Really, really important. Um, this book, How to Talk to Kids About Racism, is a wonderful book. Quick read. Uh, highly recommended if you want to learn more skills about how to talk with kids. And so how do parents talk about racial incidents with their children? So parents get overwhelmed. It's like the question that parents get usually in the car is when they're driving the car is, mom, why was I adopted? And the parents like, well, I wasn't ready for that question. So the quest, these are going to happen. So parents need to be prepared with, okay, how am I going to handle and manage when incidents occur? Because they will. 
So it's, all right, tell me what happened. They need listening. Okay. How did that make you feel? What did you say or do when that happened? If something happens like that again, do you think you'll deal with it the same way? What can we do? W I S or E. What do you want to share? What I statement do you want to say next time that happens? Because racism is out there, but it should not let it stop you or your life or being in this world and existing. You can exist. So preparing kids, because if we don't talk about racism, it will have impact on that child's mental health. And we need to talk about it. We need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. It is very uncomfortable because it is a very charged topic and subject in our culture, in our world right now. But if we don't, these kids are going to feel disconnected, lonely, have increased depression and anxiety. They are going to second guess who they are and how they're supposed to show up in the world and can feel more oppressed. They can be traumatized by these instances, microaggressions, this existential questioning, how can the world be so cruel? They can have panics, not knowing, feeling stuck in knowing what to do and what to say because nobody's actively helping them. They can have decreased hope in the future, justice, even our government as we are as we know, an increased survival mode, that they're at a toxic level of stress stress day in and day out, can have decreased trust in the world, worry, feel powerless. You can do the right thing and still end up with a horrific outcome. So we want to mitigate the impact of racism on their mental health. So task four, Provide the child with role models and positive contact with his or her minority community. Provide an environment that includes the child's race, culture on a regular basis, whether it's art, music, food, books, religious, school, integrated or same race community. Read books. And I know this is difficult right now during COVID, but how can you online go to a black service as opposed to a white church service? Um, look at art made by African Americans as opposed to what art made by Caucasian Americans, eating different diverse foods, not just your child's culture, maybe other ethnic cultures. So we're teaching diversity across the board, read books, watch movies about leaders who have rose up against discrimination and injustice. The t- this task requires that parents be comfortable with being a minority when interacting in the child's community or live in a div- diverse community. So uh, this book also, it's in their voices. Black, Ameri- Black Americans talk about being transracial adoptees in adoption. Wonderful book for parents and social workers and therapists, anyone working with transracial adoptees written by Rhonda Rorda, who's also a transracial adoptee. She interviewed many, many people across uh, the diversity world, adoptees, sociologists, therapists, social workers, on what we need to understand in a community of transracial adoption. They're wonderful interviews, great book. I highly recommend that. So when we're talking about diverse community, And I talked about this earlier about going into their community and feeling like the minority, really feel what that feels like. Um, This is a short video that talks about why this matters, why this is so important for parents to understand, feel what this feels like, and it will feel uncomfortable, but they need to understand why it matters and why diversity and live in diverse neighborhoods is crucial if you are adopting transracially. So let's watch this. In America, race is complicated. We like to think that we're a multicultural and diverse society, 
none of us wants to be labeled or think of ourselves as a racist, and most of us, or at least the vast majority of us, and we're not explicitly doing racist things or having racist thoughts. But let's think about how we actually live. Who do you worship with? Who do you eat dinner every night with? Most of us do that with people that share our race. If we're really honest about it, in those, those are two very intimate experiences. And in our most intimate experiences, most of us are living monoracially. Our children and our families, when we're built across racial lines, aren't, which means we have some different things that we have to navigate. It doesn't work very well, according to research and certainly according to the vast majority of adult adoptees of color who grew up with white parents, to live in really racially isolated areas. What happens is those kids grow up and they want to leave. Now I'll tell you, as a parent, the reason I adopted is because I wanted the profound and amazing closeness that comes from being a parent and having that relationship. I don't want to live somewhere where my kids feel they can't be their authentic self. And I don't really think you do either. So sometimes it's hard to hear, but I cannot say loudly or strongly enough, it's important that you live in an area where cross-racial relationships are possible, where your child is not isolated, where they are not an only. And we know that. So yes, it matters. And for those of you who live there, I'd urge you to think about how that's really going to work for your child. I had an adoptive parent who was living in a predominantly white neighborhood, and he had adopted two African-American children. And they were not feeling connected to their neighborhood. They were kids predominantly white. And he went to packed camp with his kids. And his kids were so much happier at pack camp being with kids like them. And he then saw the difference and he made a very big choice and he knew it was the right one. And he moved into a predominantly black neighborhood and he is the minority now, and his kids are happier. They're more connected. They have a greater sense of identity. And overall, they're even more of a multiracial tight-knit family now. Now he has friends, black friends that he didn't have before. So really, really important for parents to recognize diversity matters. So ways to integrate a child's racial and cultural history, attend culture camps. Now, yes, we're in the day of COVID right now. We can't pretty much go, go and take trips as we would normally, but something to think about in the future. There are adoption culture camps for Asian adoptees, African-American adoptees. So here's a link for you to look for different camps attend local parks that mirror the child's cultural background. Some parks are opening now. I'm in Los Angeles. I know there's people from all different parts of the country here. Um, here we have parks opening. Yay. So go to a park where your child feels mirrored if you're an adoptive parent so they can learn from their own age groups about their cultural heritage as well as for you, parents, you need to find friends of the same culture. From your of your child's and learn and just learn and listen just learn and listen place art and posters from the child's ethnic and cultural background on their walls in their rooms or around the house um, this forms as another mirror for the child so the child feels acknowledged not only within themselves but by their families too and celebrating who they are and what they can be famous leaders in their cultural history posters for their walls, books on African-American culture, Asian culture. I have a, I created a book list and I think I put it at the end of this PowerPoint of transracial books for adoptees, books for adoption for adoptees, foster care books for foster youth, um, memoirs of adoptees and former foster youth. I have lists, book lists. So you have a lot to choose from. 
um, if you're looking for more books to provide children and their families. Surround the child with toys and objects that represent the child's ethnic and cultural background. An American Girl doll that reflects their race, their color. Clothing, scarves with cultural fabrics, artifacts, and cultural jewelry. I know when I went to Argentina, I wanted to buy the jewelry so I could feel like an Amazon woman. And it was all made of wood and hand-painted, and it gave me this richness into my ethnic culture that I hadn't had before. And it really helped me value and adore who I am and where I come from. It really helped me more identify with being Argentinian. So task five is parents need to advocate on behalf of their child's positive identity. They should advocate for family, social, and educational experiences that are respectful. The parent may need to be prepared to correct or confront individuals or institutional racism, prejudice, and or discrimination that the child may encounter. As an advocate, the parent models for the child how to advocate for themselves. The child also sees and feels their parent's protection, loyalty, commitment, which is essential in attachment and bonding. This is essential in attachment and bonding. This is in a parent's best interest. If a parent is feeling distant from their child, especially I know a lot of transracial adoptive families where teenagers aren't feeling supported by their white parents because their parents haven't felt comfortable enough to even talk about racism because it's uncomfortable, but that's in their best interest. It's okay. When your child sees you're uncomfortable, they actually have so much more respect and they attach more. They feel more for their parents because their parents are feeling their experience with them. That's what attachment is. It's a parent attuning, feeling, joining with the child's experience. So it's in a parent's best interest to do this work. Confronting prejudice and discrimination on the child's behalf is no longer optional once a parent adopts transracially. Okay, that should be the t-shirt. So these are memes from... An adoptive parent saying, I don't see color is really a way of saying, I refuse to acknowledge your reality. Reality. Just think about that. If I do not see color, I refuse to acknowledge your reality. If you are a white adoptive parent of black and brown human beings of any age, and you are not actively making it your business to fight racism and denounce white supremacy, you are, do you are not doing enough. And this comes from April Dinwoody. She has a podcast I highly recommend. I do have it listed at the end of this PowerPoint called Born in June, Raised in April. Born in, yeah. And her podcast speaks a lot to the transracial adoption experience. So I highly recommend you listen to her podcast. More voices. These are memes by transracial adoptive parents. To the parents of young adult and older transracial black adoptees, check on your children. Tell them you are listening. Do not negate their feelings. Ask how you can be supportive. Work to be anti-racist. Repeat. Because if adoptive parents have a hard time saying black lives matter, their children will too. That just chokes me up. Me up. Okay, so this is an adoptee manifesto. Angela Tucker is a big voice in the transracial adoption world. She also has a new podcast. I've put that at the end of this PowerPoint for you to listen to and visit her website. She created the adoptee manifesto for transracial adoptees <clears throat> and for adoptees. <clears throat> An adoptee manifesto. We can love more than one set of parents. Relationships with our birth parents, foster parents, and our adoptive parents are not mutually exclusive. We have the right to our own original birth certificate. Curiosity about our roots is innate. 
We need access to our family medical history. The pre-verbal memories you have with your first family are real. Postnatal culture shock exists. It's okay to feel a mixture of gratitude and loss. We are not alone. We have each other. And she's speaking to other adoptees. And adoptees need to be with other adoptees also because that's an identity in and of itself. They need to know they're not alone. That's the culture of adoption. So I love this. You can even print this. She sells them on her website, AngelaTucker.com for a child that you are working with. So adolescence is another difficult time. This comes from one of the research handouts that I gave you. Uh, Adoptees identify quickly with their adoptive parents. White culture, but may eventually seek to reclaim their birth culture through reculturation. So you have a whole handout on what reculturation is. And this is initiated by the adoptee themselves. And what happens for the adoptee is they want to go into activities that reflect their physical appearance, contact with members of their racial ethnic heritage. They begin to attend racially diverse schools, whether it's in college or choosing to go to a diverse school in high school. They want to live in racially diverse neighborhoods. They have contacts with same race ethnicity ethnicity child care providers. They seek out teachers of their race. They seek out adult, adult role models of their race. They choose education and ethnic studies. They want to learn more about their native language. Some kids are ready sooner than others. Some kids, it takes them a while. They're just not ready. You know, we have to follow an adolescent's lead. We want to have open dialogue, but if they say they're not ready to maybe explore more Asian culture, they're not ready. We need to step back. They drive that boat when they want to seek more of their identity. They, it's their, they initiate this. So, and it usually occurs in late adolescence and young adulthood when they really start living more in the world on their own, separate from their white parents, that they feel the draw and connection to their racial and ethnic culture, that they feel this pull, like, I want to be like that. I want to be like more like me and where I come from. So this is what reculturation is about. Um, They may take classes on history, cultural of their birth country. They may want to attend uh, heritage camps, learn language, take language classes, attend events held by adoptees, join support groups for adoptees, and they may even want to reach out and search for their birth family. And read. they will read more books on adoption, reculturation, and so, th- so they can process the losses and the gains that they have from both families, their birth family, ethnic and racial, racial culture, and their adoptive ethnic and racial culture. But they want to have a balance there and decide for themselves how they want to identify in the world. So research indicates that when racial minority youth have personally explored the meaning of their racial membership for themselves, they have a positive view of their race and a secure identification as member of that race. They have higher self-esteem and more positive mental health outcomes than youth who do not take this step. So really important for us to integrate their racial and ethnic cultural history. So learn more from these transracial adoptees. There was an NPR radio show interviewing transracial adoptees. Rhonda Rorda, I showed you her book. Uh, Amanda Baden is, she's an Asian adoptee who does a lot of research studies. And I've, you have three of her studies. Um, Angela Tucker, she did, created the Adoptee Manifesto. And April Dinwoody has a podcast. Highly recommend you listen to that. 
here's my list of books on trans transracial adoption and many other subjects, diversity, foster care, birth, cancer, divorce, mindfulness, trauma, even addiction for kids. There are books out there and being a multiracial family and organizations that support transracial adoptive families is packed adopt. They are now on the East and West coast. They support adopted children of color by providing not only adoptive placement, but lifelong education, group support and community for adoptees and their families on matters of adoption and race. They also have many resources on their website, videos, classes, workshops. Highly recommend you provide that for the families you're working with. These are organizations supporting racial justice colorofchange.org, Black Lives Matter, Present, U.S. for All of Us, No Room for Racism. Having parents get involved with these organizations, be on their email list, provide information to their children <clears throat> so that they feel a sense of empowerment that they can do something about this. And here are all the references for my training. Uh, I helped develop this conference. We have many sessions. It's November 14th to 15th. Rhonda Rorda actually will be at our conference. And she talks about real talk and race. And she's pretty honest with adoptive parents. And she's also the adoptee consultant on the show, This Is Us. And if you haven't seen that show, I highly recommend. It's very well done. And it is a white family adopts a child of color and we see his development. We see how they did and did not incorporate his race into their world and their community and how that showed up through his behavior and how he grew up as an adult and the struggles that he faces, uh, whether it's racism or being an adoptee and wanting to find his roots and know his birth family powerful, powerful show. So this is a family that I've worked with, uh, transracial adoption. So I, there's a chat here. If anyone wants to ask me questions, yes, I can send out a link to the transracial resource books. It's in that PowerPoint there. I think you can see me now. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm looking at the chat right now. Yeah. So now you can hear me. Now you can hear me. I think you can hear me now. I'm sorry about what happened this morning. I did a um, test last night and that recorded and then it replayed and I'm like, ah. So that started as the training this morning. So I'm so sorry. If you want to start this again, I will have a link provided for you to watch this again. You can also share it with any families that you're working with. Um, is there any other questions as we're here? We have a few more minutes or comments. I actually wanted to ask everybody, how do you think transracial adoption changes the world's perception of race? and diversity. Because I think truly transracial adoption is a model in our country about acknowledging all races. It's very powerful. Very, very powerful. I thank you all for being here. I hope this was educational. I hope you gained some new knowledge. I hope you looked deeper inside yourself and learned something new, an aha moment something you didn't think about before. And I also encourage you to do diversity trainings within your agencies, your communities, because we need more education, support, more models showing up and doing this work and making it okay to talk about race. And with transracial adoption, as there's, so much diversity and its complexities. There's challenges, there's triumphs, there's, there's 
changes that occur developmentally for parents, for children. Adoption is a wonderful thing, a beautiful way to form a family. However, families do need to be educated on the seven core challenges. And that's one of our trainings at our conference at the National Adoption Conference with Sharon Rosia, that we need to be mindful of all these pieces, identity, grief, loss, intimacy, guilt that we may be feeling, um, rejection, fears of rejection, anger, feeling a sense of control or not feeling a sense of control. So really important to take all these factors and be mindful. And it's not easy being a parent in general and an adoptive parent. I think it's even harder. It's, it's harder. And the, the benefits, the love and the needs, the meeting, the needs for that child is so crucial and important and children. And I am an adult adoptee. I had so much love and still have so much love for my foster adoptive family because they have helped me become the person I am today. And I have love for all the cultures, all the ethnicities that I got to be and try on and experience. And I'm grateful for that because it's made me a richer person, a stronger person and more diverse and more tolerable person for all this diversity in the world. So I wish you all well. I don't see that there's any more questions and I hope everyone takes care, stays healthy. And you can email me Jeanette at yofftherapy.com. J E A N E T T E at yofftherapy.com. All right. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing such an amazing story in this book. All You Can Ever Know encapsulates what your life was. You grew up as a child who was adopted. Mm -hmm. uh, you were raised by white parents who loved you to the ends of the earth. But in this book, you talk about something that many people struggle with every day, and that is the relationship of being a child who is adopted, who is living in a transracial household. Why is that so difficult? I think um, it's just difficult, I think, given that a lot of the, first of all, a lot of people go into adoption not necessarily fully prepared uh, to talk about race, uh, which is, of course, crucial in a transracial adoption. Right. You know, like my parents, for example, went in and they asked a lot of questions of a lot of different experts, social workers and judges and adoption attorneys, and they were basically told, don't worry about it. You know, it's going to be okay no matter what. Um, you don't really have to talk about this. It's not going to be relevant. And, of course, it very much was. Right, because you read in the book, and you write about how you, you had this experience where your, your parents didn't talk to you about race at all. It was just ignored completely. It's mm -hmm. never mentioned. And many people would agree with that. They would say, but yes, why, why should your parents talk to you about race, Nicole? Because they don't see you as a color. They, they're seeing you as Nicole, their daughter. So why, why do you think it would have been necessary or should be necessary for people to speak to their kids about race if they've adopted them? It's completely natural in a way for parents. Of course, it doesn't affect like their love for their child. I wasn't like my parents didn't think of me as their Korean child or their adopted child. I was just their child. Um, I think what none of us really knew how to talk about so much, especially when I was young, was the fact that, of course, even if it didn't matter to them, it was going to matter a great deal to me in my life. It was right. going to matter. Other people would notice. They would comment. Um, and I think also none of us were really prepared for all the questions that we got, you know, moving about in the world because we kind of stood out in my hometown. Right. Right. So often when I got those questions, I wasn't really sure, like, what to say because in my life at home, it wasn't really acknowledged or spoken about. Your book takes us through such a painful, exciting, loving, wonderful journey where you begin to explore who you are and you have that yearning to find out the rest of your story. And, and that in of itself, I mean, you, you described it in such detail, is, is scary, but at the same time, really exciting. Why do you think it was so important for you to want to find who your biological parents were, where you had these parents who loved you so much? I had thought about it for many years, and really for me, what was the final push was when I became pregnant with my first child. Um, up until that point, 
I, I thought, of course, about what it would feel like to have a child and to share my life and my history with them. Um, but I hadn't really thought about how being adopted would affect them, like what questions they might have. And I remember so vividly sitting like at my first prenatal appointment, getting all these questions about my medical history and like what my birth mother's pregnancy and her births were like. And I had no answers. Right. And I suddenly just felt like this deep sense of um, fear and inadequacy that this was information I needed to have, that my children might need to have. So that was really the final push. You went out, you searched, and you found your answers. Um, I don't want to give away a lot of the book, but, the, but there is a beautiful connection that you made with a sibling who you discovered. Uh, your, your sister, I believe you have two, right? And a half-sister and a full sister, as you call them in the book. But, but you were very close to, to your sister. That is, that is a really interesting relationship to have, somebody who has been a stranger your whole life and let you, f you feel like you've known them forever. Yes, yeah, she's an amazing person. And a lot of this book really, it's her story as well as mine. Um, you kind of get both stories on a parallel, parallel tracks and then they intersect when we finally meet and find out about each other. Um, and she's just an amazing person. I feel so lucky to have her in my life. Um, my kids have always just known her because, right. like, we connected the same month that I gave birth. Um, but it's been interesting to talk with them about it just in terms of, like, they kind of take it for granted that, like, she's there, that we're together, that we have this family and these relationships we've recovered. Um, but really, we had to do a lot of work, and um, it took a lot of effort and it, a lot of heartache to put our family back together in this way. So it's not something I'll ever take for granted. It's beautiful. It's a page turner. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. <laughs> All you can ever know is available now. A beautiful story. Nicole Chung, everybody.